So in the seminar, which we've been doing, I argued that human rights are best understood as something we claim rather than something we have or possess. Indeed, because we cannot be too confident that we do possess them, and one just needs to look around to have a sense of how often they are lacking, we need to claim them. And that's not enough either. There is no magic formula that brings rights into reality. They are simply the way we define for ourselves what it is to be who or what we are. I quoted Lafour. They are the utterances by which we name the human elements in one another, names that operate independently of natural, supernatural, metaphysical, or any other essential foundations or predeterminations. Who or what is a human who or what is a human being, and hence who is qualified as a rights bearer is not given in advance. Rights are, pre are proposed as claims addressed to others. They seek assent and ratification, and thus they regularly demand the, the, involve the presentation of evidence, precisely because the demand for rights, even at the most apparently basic level of presenting oneself as a human, is not self-evident, never goes without some saying and some showing. A word that captures this configuration of claim and evidence might be advocacy. Another might be forensics. So there's a lot of media of verbal and visual artistry involved in the project of claiming rights. I do not so much present as represent myself before others, act as if I am one of them, appear before them in word and sound and image, and seek to persuade them of my status and my rights. Often this happens by presenting evidence of wrongs, injustice, suffering, and seeks to establish the humanity of the claimant by the projection of an analogy with the addressees. This should not happen either to you or to me. And sometimes, although this is fraught with even other, even more complex difficulties, these claims are made on behalf of subjects who are said to be incapable of speaking for themselves, whether by virtue of being held incommunicado or because they have been killed or disappeared, because they are completely unrecognizable as humans in the present configuration of the com community, because they do not have a voice that can be heard. But all voices need amplification of one sort or another, even the ones we sometimes too confidently assume are our own. Although it's not exactly the same thing to represent yourself and to represent someone or something else, there is always some representation going on that puts us at an irreducible distance from the putative origin or ground. That is why evidence is required. And these days, some of the best equipment it seems to be in, a, in your pocket, where frequently is to be found a high-resolution camera, GPS locator, metadata generator, and transmission device, all in one object. Tonight, I want to consider one famous case and a more recent echo of it, um, in which police violence was captured and represented on video, and then explore the different ways this uh, famous case of Rodney King has been thought about and presented different modes of assembling it and handling its deployment in disputes over rights. By looking at uh, this one highly publicized and then the more recent version of cases in which video evidence has been said to fail, we can perhaps get a better grip on how it works. Police actions in the US seem more exposed than ever to a sort of civil counter surveillance, whether the cameras are those of passers-by, activists, or the police, uh, the um, dashboard or body cameras of the police themselves. In July of 2014, in New York City's Staten Island, a black man named Eric Garner was choked to death by police officers attempting to arrest him on minor charges. The arrest and the death were recorded by a bystander with a mobile phone and widely viewed. The footage gave rise to demands for justice, a trial of the officers and the reform of the police procedures which led to Garner's death. So when a grand jury decided not to charge the arresting officers with a crime, there was widespread outrage and protest, especially in the context of a rash of deaths of young black men at the hands of the police, many of them also videotaped. I can't breathe, Garner's desperate words repeated to the police and the camera, became one more rallying cry in the growing lexicon of injustice doubling injustice. In a piece published a couple of summers ago in Art Forum, following this decision not to charge Garner's killers with a crime, 
the art historian and cultural theorist David Jocelyn drew a provocative set of questions from this register of contemporary political injustice and tragedy. He posed this query in response to the Staten Island events. Quote, if the excruciating video showing Garner seized and relentlessly piled on by the police could not convince a jury, how can forms of aesthetic critique based on research and visual evidence be any more effective with a general public? The primary target of this interrogation, forms of aesthetic critique based on research and evidence, which he also calls post-conceptual art and the ideological promises of representation. The primary target seems to be the work that Eyal Weitzman and others have developed around the notion of forensis, including an exhibition in Berlin and the book that Eyal and I wrote on the birth of human rights forensics called Mengele's Skull which we subtitled The Advent of a Forensic Aesthetics. We were interested in, chart, in charting the emergence over the last 30 years alongside the by now widely recognized importance of testimony and the eyewitness in the production of human rights claims of another sort of factor, the appearance of non-human objects, whether images or documents or ruins or bones, as evidence in tribunals, courts, and public forums. The word forum as we mentioned earlier uh, today, is at the root of the word forensics, which does not refer originally to medico-legal science, but rather to the presentation of arguments and evidence in a public debate. When I was in high school, I was in the forensic team, which was the debate team, not the grave digging team. We were interested in the ways these objects sometimes acquired a voice, told a story, bore and transmitted the impression of an event or a life and we sought to analyze the mechanisms, technical, legal, political, rhetorical, through which these things were inscribed and played a role in various claim-making regimes. We asked whether the much heralded age of testimony might slowly be receding before or giving way to a forensic moment. Later, we were interested to discover an amazing sentence from the first chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Ocampo, who said, one of our goals is a case with no witnesses, no victims, no victims who testify. Our research and argument in Mengele's skull was governed by one fundamental claim above all else, which was also repeated in the volume from this Berlin exhibition called Forensis. We spoke of what we called the non-self-evidence of evidence. The fact that no piece of evidence, not even eyewitness testimony, speaks for itself. And that the process of forensics, or if we've, as we've been talking about today, sort of civil counter forensics, is precisely that of making claims about what the evidence is saying. Claims that need to be made because what is being made evident remains in dispute. So in Forensis we wrote, evidence is precisely that which is not self-evident. It becomes evident only in the eyes and ears of others. In this, we were more or less faithful to Bruno Latour's argument that assemblies or forums come together or gather around exactly objects in dispute. Latour says, we don't assemble because we agree, but because we are brought together by divisive matters of concern. Or as he says elsewhere about science, the facts, contrary to the age-old adage, obviously do not speak for themselves. To claim that they do would be to overlook scientists, their controversies, their laboratories, their instruments, their articles, and their hesitant speech, interrupted occasionally by deictic gestures. Okay, so there's a lot of apparatus. So in that light, Jocelyn's questions seem somewhat puzzling. How can we account, he wrote, for the fact that the video of a police officer pressing his arm against Garner's throat, a document that could not have been less ambiguous, did not speak for itself before the members of the grand jury. He puts speak for itself in quotation marks, but I think he means it. If such a visual artifact can so blatantly fail in the task of representation before the law, both politically as the proxy for an absent victim and rhetorically as evidence. Doesn't this present a challenge to how we define the politics of art?" Unquote. 
The answer seems almost as obvious as he seems to think the evidence is. This is exactly what we need to account for. The disposition of evidence in court or in public debate, the possibility that what might seem to be unambiguous can be rendered ambiguous. The notion of failure suggests that the videotape was designed to function in one way, working, and that it's not working that way must be treated as a malfunction or a breakdown of an otherwise reliable instrument. But getting the evidence to function for one party in a dispute or the other is precisely the terrain of forensics in this other sense, the uncertain and only field in which visual evidence can possibly operate. If evidence could or did speak for itself, after all, what need would we have of juries or judges or of public opinion or of science? What evidence calls for is judgment, and judgment emerges contingently and without guarantees or ultimate certainty from the force field of interpretation, argument, persuasion, power. What needs to be understood, accounted for in his terms, in any given situation are a wide range of things. I'll just list a few. The protocols of interpretation and presentation, the arguments made and not made, the criteria by which evidence is admitted, the ways in which it can carry other associations and meanings beyond what seems to be obvious, the grain of its resolution and the structures of its narration, the chain of its custody, the credibility of the narrator presenting it, and the seemingly extrinsic factors that can affect a judgment. In other words, all the elements of persuasion that go into the production of an interpretive decision. Blatant failure, his phrase, is an old story, precisely where race and the law meet in the United States. And it calls for a fundamental reassessment of the strategies that go into making claims of this sort with images. It's just that reassessment that Jocelyn seems to jettison and that the Forensis Project aimed to stimulate. Not to give up on evidence, not to forego making claims about what we call public truth, but on the contrary, to understand how it functions so that the claims we try to make with it for basic human rights and justice might have a better chance of being heard. Jocelyn's argument ultimately takes an unusual turn. He contrasts the forensic production of evidence with the work of the conceptual performance artist William Pope L., and particularly a piece in which he eats and then vomits the pages of the Wall Street Journal which he calls the adjudication of information or evidence and its rejection. Jocelyn says that Pope L's action, quote, implodes representation, insisting instead on the right and capacity to decide how information is consumed. In other words, this is still Jocelyn, the presumed enlightenment rationality of the forum of forensis is contradicted by the particularity of individual bodies. Unquote. His concern turns on the question of representation precisely. He worries that the forms in which political representations of injustice are offered, courts or assemblies for instance, are structurally biased against hearing or acknowledging certain claims or recognizing certain parties. Pope L's refusal of these spaces and rejection of its habitual material information and the means of mobilizing it, reason and representation, thus seems to signal a judgment that there is no justice to be found in so-called democratic forums. Some wrongs simply cannot be represented, some truths cannot be told. I'm paraphrasing his argument. He concludes, and this is a quote, it's tragic and deeply troubling that Garner could not be represented in that Staten Island courtroom, but it's a fact a fact that thinkers like Stefano Harney and Fred Moten have confronted by recognizing another kind of space beyond or beside democratic forums, a space that Pope L. has also imagined and inhabited. The police choked Garner. His last words were, I can't breathe. And he was silenced again in the courtroom. Forensis failed him. And that is why Pope L.'s decision to vomit out information rather than trusting it to speak for itself is significant. Information is never innocent. Its toxicity depends on who is consuming and who is consumed." Unquote. 
It seems to me that rationality and trust are the key words here. Trust and presumed enlightenment rationality are indeed the enemies where evidence is concerned. And everything you can do with evidence, you can only do when you no longer trust it to speak on its own, and when reasoning is not the only rhetorical game you play. It's when we trust the evidence to do the talking for us, which by definition it can't, that we are destined for disappointment. And anyone who thinks that the forums in which decisions like the ones at stake here get made are spaces of enlightened reason needs to have his or her head examined. Whatever case you hope to win by refusing to make an argument, by imagining that your evidence will do it for you, you don't deserve to win. But if the opposite of trust and reason are art, as Jocelyn seems to suggest here, then it's only a failure of imagination that leads him to turn for his alternative to something that so directly announces itself as art, like this performance. Why give up on truth, on persuasion, on representation, on information, just because it cannot be trusted? What needs to be accounted for, I would suggest, is what there is of art or the aesthetic, another idea of representation, rhetoric, inscription, already at play in the field of forensics and visual evidence itself. So now I want to back up and explore a little bit of the context of this, and then we'll turn to Rodney King. In more than one sense, we're still living in the epoch that began a bit more than a quarter century ago, on March 3rd, 1991, when a man named George Holliday, awakened by sirens and the noise of a helicopter overhead, pointed his brand new Sony Handycam from the balcony of his Los Angeles apartment window at the street below and recorded the beating of Rodney King by a group of LA police officers. The videotape he shot and its juridical aftermath ignited a national debate in the United States about race and police violence, and also inaugurated a massive and destructive riot in America's second largest city. So the video had an effect. In fact, it had all sorts of effects, but in evaluating them, we're led to a number of contradictory conclusions. On the one hand, <coughs> The video inaugurated what we today call citizen photojournalism, or civic surveillance, or camcorder, or smartphone activism. Unauthorized by anyone else, without any positional, official position or professional status, purely by virtue of his contingent presence alongside the scene, Holiday made a tape that made the event public. It was evidence, on screen and in court, of a genre of police violence that was widely known but had few witnesses outside of its perpetrators and victims. The tape documented a moment, recorded something happening, and made it available for others far from the scene and far into the future. And it told a story, taking its place as one more in a long line of narrative dramas about the police that TV had made into an essential staple of popular culture, but altering the storyline in equally dramatic fashion. That said, on the other hand, it was notoriously unsuccessful as a piece of evidence in the California trial of the four police officers charged with the beating. It was a trial whose outcome had already largely been, had already been largely decided by the public, and so the result of the detour through an actual criminal proceeding in a state court and the outcome of that proceeding came as a cultural and political shockwave. In the space between what the tape seemed to show and what the jury decided, an insurrection erupted, and the outlines of a debate, which as the Garner story indicates hasn't been settled, took shape. The debate was less about what the verdict was and more about how and on what basis it had been rendered. What exactly was the function of those images of the police at work? Here's a typical assessment of the difference the video made from a media blogger writing on the 20th anniversary of the, of the event. He reminds us first that while there had been earlier examples of citizen photojournalism, and he points to the Zapruder film uh, as an example, quote, the Rodney King video was a turning point. By 1991, home video gear was becoming common, heading toward today's near ubiquity. When people saw that video, they realized a number of things, not least of which was the possibility that average citizens could hold powerful people, 
the police in this instance, somewhat more accountable for, wrong, for the wrongdoing they committed in public places. Witnessing was being transformed into action, we all understood. It's a kind of emblem of a, of a lot of work on uh, civic photojournalism. Witnessing was being transformed into action. And for emphasis, he adds that this wasn't just a fact, but a widely held cultural belief we all understood. This notion is perhaps best summed up in the slogan adopted by the human rights organization Witness, founded the following year to distribute those same camcorders to citizen and civil society activists around the world. The Witness motto was, see it, film it, change it. Through the camera, what had been for a long time an action of personal moral responsibility, an ethic of witness that found its outlet not in transformation but in memory, not in a demand for justice but in a defense against oblivion, now seemed to have been elevated to a new level of engagement. Now the camera has, practically since its invention, been thought of as an evidentiary tool, and photography has long served as an instrument of policing, surveillance, identification, crime scene analysis, and investigation. But what's interesting, and there's a lot of scholarship on that, as I'm sure you know, but what's interesting here is the reversal of the gaze. Now the police are not the ones taking the pictures, but the ones being pictured. Sekula, Alan Sekula coined a brilliant word for this, counter forensics. When Witness describes the power of the Rodney King video, they say, the footage broadcast on TV screens around the globe initiated an international conversation about police brutality and racial discrimination. I'm going to skip a couple of pages here about the history of uh, eyewitness video, in which people are very optimistic about how valuable it is. And yet the trial of the LA police officers in which this evidence that everyone had seen so many times played such a central role, did not vindicate the claims it seemed to make, nor the claims made more generally for its effects. Indeed, the officers were acquitted of all the charges against them, hence the riots, and the powerful images seemed to have blatantly failed. They were evidence, but they were not proof. The failure of the holiday videotape to convince the jury and to convict the police has been analyzed in a variety of ways. There is one fundamental way to understand this failure. The prosecutors did not make very good use of their evidence. Their strategy was more or less, and if you watch the film, it's kind of, uh, you watch the um, uh, video record of the trial, it's kind of amazing. Their strategy was more or less to play the video, point to it, and say, see? They acted as if it spoke for itself. The defense team, on the other hand, didn't. They actually offered an interpretation of what was going on in the video, and in the end, persuaded the jury. We could say, in spite of the evidence, or we could say, thanks to the evidence. So I want to take a quick run through the three best explanations of this apparently unexpected outcome, all ingenious and insightful in their descriptions, but all sharing a fundamental commitment in varying degrees that the outcome was an error. Not just that it shouldn't have happened, but that it was in some sense incorrect or a mistake. So the first is um, from Avital Rennell, who's emphasized what she calls the violence of treating the moving video image as a series of frames or stills, which was the strategy of the defense lawyers. She says, the defense team takedown involved approaching George Holliday's videotape by replicating the violence that had been done to Rodney King. The unquestioned premise on which the team of lawyers based their defense of the police called for an interpretation of the video in terms of a frame-by-frame -frame procedure. And indeed, that's what the lawyers defending the police did. They took apart the video, broke it down into static frames, into single still images, and retold the story of King attacked by the police in altogether different terms. Slowed down and frozen, the tape could be seen to indicate that the agency was on King's side and that a series of motions he made when frozen 
could well have been interpreted by the police as suggesting a threat or even an action that needed to be countered. This interpretation, though, was no more violent than any other. Frames were not added or subtracted, just re-narrated, differently emphasized, alternatively explained. It seems risky to me to suggest that one narrative is present in all its innocence and accuracy in the tape played at the proper speed and that changing the speed somehow censors or disfigures its original speech. This ontology of the moving image seems a bit too fundamental, especially in a courtroom. Taking things out of context, after all, happens every day. Now Shoshana Fellman, in another influential reading of the case, has described what happened in that courtroom as a, quote, failure to see, and attributes it to a cultural blind spot that she associates with race. She says, the jurors in the Simi Valley trial, it was held outside of Los Angeles in a white suburb called Simi Valley. The jurors in the Simi Valley trial, all white, did not see the beating of the black person, she says. And then in a slightly uh, but importantly different formulation, she says, the jury watched the film but claimed it did not see police abuse. She finds the implicit claim hard to believe. They had to see it, she seems to suggest, and charges the jury thus with, quote, a failure to act as eyewitnesses to the physical and moral violence whose literal invisibility cannot be dispelled in court in spite of the most probatory visual evidence, unquote. The evidence is probative, probative, she says. It does prove what happened, and the jury cannot not have seen it, even if they acted as if they did. This version of the reproach of denial or fetishism, they know very well what the tape shows, but nonetheless act as though it doesn't, again seems to me to border on or to cross the border into wishfulness, as if it's so hard to believe that the jury did not see what was so plainly there to be seen that the only explanation is that they actually did and then ignored it. It treats the question, how could they not have seen, as a rhetorical rather than a literal one and ends up taking the seeing for granted. The suggestion that this failure to see or blindness, which is a slightly different uh, problem in fact, happens not at the individual or group level but at a cultural one, that's her word, cultural, does advance the analysis a bit, but that important insight will forever be hamstrung if it starts from the conclusion that the images can and ought to speak for themselves, that seeing what happened happens transparently, and that the force of culture leads its bearers to turn away from what they see but do not want to face or admit. So as if there's a cultural interpretation but a natural fact of the, what the video shows. Judith Butler, finally, she's my third example, takes this um, cultural-ish analysis, probably not the best word, one major step further, arguing that it's not simply a matter of the gap between what is seen in the tape and a reading or an interpretation imposed on it, but more radically, that the very possibility of seeing police brutality here is structured by other factors, notably race and racism. Here's the um, powerful paragraph of her analysis. To the extent that there is a racist organization and disposition of the visible, it will work to circumscribe what qualifies as visual evidence, such that it is in some cases impossible to establish the truth of racial brutality through recourse to visual evidence. For when the visual is fully schematized by racism, the visual evidence to which one refers will always and only refute the conclusions based upon it. For it is possible within this racist episteme that no black person can seek recourse to the visible as the sure ground of evidence. That's a powerful claim. This seems closest to Jocelyn's implicit position. Certain representations are impossible to make in certain conditions. They are ruled out in advance, unregistered, 
in the visual or verbal field of appearance. Butler's argument, though, doesn't take the visibility or legibility of the evidence for granted. On the contrary, it starts from the notion that visibility is not guaranteed, but is rather forum or schema dependent. She seeks rather, and this is what I appreciate about it, to understand the conditions under which the evidence is presented and received, and to suggest that in some cases, there are assumptions that allow representations, sorry, in some cases, the assumptions that allow representations to become visible can completely rule other images out. She calls this fully schematized, 100% saturated, totally controlled. So if you have any doubts about this presumption of possible totality, which I do, then her argument can also point toward possible transformations in those conditions, which I think the other two arguments don't. It puts the emphasis on the forum that has gathered around the evidence and on the protocols that govern the legibility and admissibility of evidence there. And protocols are not simply legal protocols, they'll now be societal, cultural, social protocols. Sorry, that's the next sentence. Many of those protocols, even in a duly constituted court of law, are not simply legal ones. And there is always, that means that there's always another possibility, that the contexts of the context can shift, or even that some, form, some sorts of evidence can have the effect themselves of shifting or reconstituting what seem to be relatively fixed rules about interpreting them that they can resist giving in to the pre-constituted context, but in fact, challenge and change it. That this did not happen in this case, thanks to the way in which seeing was constituted in a manner sympathetic to white policemen and unsympathetic to black victims, does not mean it had to happen, though. If, as she says, to quote it again, it is possible within this racist episteme that no black person can seek recourse to the visible as the sure ground of evidence, then it is also possible that other, message, other objects, other messengers, other images can accomplish this recourse, not as the sure ground of evidence, but as evidence nonetheless. In other words, visual evidence is not simply visible. It needs to become visible. And the question for the, target of viol the targets of violence and their advocates equipped with this image is how to make it visible. The short answer to this problem is that there's never a guarantee of success in these situations. There are just better and worse rhetorical, representational, forensic strategies. The fact that the prosecutors failed, and they did fail, that their rather primitive strategy of pointing to the tape barely making the effort to speak for it, translate it, interpret it, frame and reframe it, all in the interest of underlining its would-be self-evidence. I think it was a deliberate move on their part to uh, resist interpreting in an effort to enhance the apparently self-evident character of the video. The fact that this bare minimum of advocacy did not persuade the jury should probably not surprise us that much in the end. The defense lawyers made a case about what the videotape showed. As Rennell says, the prosecution appeared to believe that the video spoke for itself and did nothing to produce a reading of the idiom of video. And she continues, video requires a reading, having little to do with immediate sense perception, unquote. But then I don't think she follows through on that uh, insight. On the other hand, the defense team went all out interpretively. As Butler points out, over against this reading, the defense team's reading, is required an aggressive counter-reading, one which the prosecutors failed to perform." Unquote. Would it have worked to break the effects of invisibility? Who knows, but the fact is that you need to try in order to find out. This counter-reading would thus correspond to what we've called counter-forensics the hard technical rhetorical work of making evidence speak, the lending of voice and image to the task of persuasion, the claiming of public truths and of rights. And this is in fact happening now. So we spent today in the seminar 
uh, examining a set of new projects in counter forensics applied to the question of borders and refugees. Strategies that start by rejecting not representation, but the idea that it's obvious and that you can do without it. It's a move that embraces mediation rather than fleeing from it toward the homeland of transparency or the self-satisfaction of what is nicknamed critical distance. Rejecting immediacy, plunging into rhetoric and persuasion, taking the risks of making claims and arguments. These projects know that they operate without guarantees, far from any sure ground of evidence, and seek instead to produce new surfaces of appearance and register new figures in and on them. What needs to be remembered when we challenge the plight of the rightless and abandoned, those who do not manage to appear or make themselves heard on our political stages, as Rancière insisted, is that rights are theirs when they can do something with them to confront the denial of rights they suffer, and that, quote, there are always people among them who do it. There you go. Thank you.